Hi guys and welcome to my YouTube channel or welcome back to my YouTube channel if you have joined me here before. As always, it is a pleasure to have you. My name's Ewan and I go by Hardback Hype Beast when I talk about books on the internet. And I'm here today, obviously, to make a YouTube video, but to inject a little bit of excitement into things, I have not yet decided what that video is going to be. I have two videos that are uh, due, waiting to be made. I'm making it sound like homework, it's not. But I've got my March reading wrap up to do, as it is now. Uh, today is the 1st of April, I believe. Yes, it is the 1st of April, so my March reading wrap up is it's time to do that. And also I have um, been getting my hands on a huge pile of books from the Gillette Prize, the Women's Prize and the International Booker Prize long lists. Not the whole lists, just books that personally I was interested in reading. Um, and essentially I am still waiting on a book that is relevant to my March reading wrap up arriving for reasons that will become clear and a book, the final book that I wanted um, for my book prize haul uh, because I had to have it imported so I've had to wait a while to get it. Um, so I'm basically, I'm waiting for a book for both videos and one book has arrived. So I don't know what's in here. Um, so depending on what book is in here will dictate whether this video becomes my March reading wrap up or my prize book haul. So all exciting stuff, guys. Does that make sense? I don't even know if it makes sense to me. I think it makes sense. So <clears throat> let me, uh, got my scissors here. Um, what this is. Okay, so this book has just become my March reading wrap up. I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. Whew, that was exciting. Well, <laughs> I, I hope you guys found it as exciting as I did anyway, but now I've realised I'm actually vastly unprepared to do this video, but we'll just wing it and see how it goes. Also going to call out the continuity error right now. Now that I know what this video is going to be, I've reordered just to be in the order which I want to speak about them. Um, and to get the... Um, What's the word? Um, just to, to, to come clean up front what the book was that arrived. It was the American edition, Poppy Show, of Leonie Ross's This One Sky Day. So, I mean, I think you can already tell that I waited forever for this to be imported from the US. That I absolutely loved this book and needed to have the American edition and the British edition. Not least because I still don't understand why they have different names and would be fascinated to know the reason why. Um, so on the off chance, Leone, that you watch this video, um, let us know. We're curious. Um, so yeah, so this one Sky Day, which is what it's called in the UK and I'm pretty sure the UK was its original publishing home. I think it was published in the UK first by Faber. Um, don't hold me to that, I don't know for sure. But anyway, for that reason, we'll go with this one Sky Day as the title for the rest of the video. It's long listed for the Women's Prize and very deservedly so. Um, I said in my, um, sorry, just quickly show you this UK cover, which was in my book haul for February. Um, and then show you the American cover, which I much prefer, but both are gorgeous. Um, let me know which one you prefer and which title you prefer down below. Um, yeah, I I prefer this one just because I think it's a bit more representative of how the book made me feel. Although I do understand why the UK cover is this because if you open it like that, it is meant to be uh, the back of a butterfly, um, which makes sense in the context of the book. Anyway, I'm rambling. Um, yeah, so this one Sky Day. Um, was the first book that I read in March and I absolutely loved it. I said in my book haul whenever I whenever I picked this book up, I'm pretty sure it was February. Um, I've only done four videos and I already can't remember which one is which. Um, get used to that. Um, but um, yeah, I said that the reason why I picked this up was based on Simon's recommendation, but also just because um, obviously the world is quite stressful right now, isn't it always, but especially so right now and uh, I wanted something a little bit escapist which isn't um, necessarily particularly where I, what I'll reach for, I tend to more centre myself around books that are based in the real world if you like and this isn't but this does exactly what I think like a kind of soft fantasy um, novel should in that uh, it takes you into this like amazing island paradise 
like soft fantasy other world setting but then within that setting it deals with like real world issues and um, so you get this like fascinating blend of like really interesting and cool world building getting to know all these new characters and like the intricacies of a different world but um it feels like interesting and uh, i hate to say the word adult because i, I um, think that's like a bit of a cheap way to describe something like what is adult but just like still feels like a, a book for grown-ups if you know what i mean uh, maybe that's worse but yeah so essentially uh, this entire thing is set on an island a um, um, fantasy island called Poppy Show and you follow um, over the course of one day this cast of characters but particularly you're focused on three characters and the central character is a man called Xavier and basically he is so everyone on Poppy Show has a certain type of magic called cores and essentially uh, no one knows what someone's cores is going to be they kind of, it kind of reveals itself after someone's born and it can reveal itself straight away it can be like a bodily difference like uh, a third eye or a third arm or like superhuman strength um that you can obviously see when when, when a baby is born or it can be something um, that kind of reveals itself over time like the ability to heal people um and xavier's cores is the ability to season food uh, using only his hands he doesn't need any ingredients and because of this he is then not elected but revealed to be the island's machinus i think is how you pronounce it which basically means it becomes his responsibility to kind of bring the community of the island together by cooking for each and every person on the island at least once um, and because of his cores because of his magic he cooks an individual meal for each person that is based on exactly the food that they want to eat um, and essentially we follow him over the course of this one day and the governor on the island who's this like corrupt seedy individual uh, his daughter is getting married and he wants the machinist to cook for the wedding which is kind of a little bit controversial and a little bit like nepotistic using your position to get something that you shouldn't really be getting um and then yeah um there's just like there's so much that i could say about this book but i don't want to spoil like the journey or the experience of reading it but yeah say over one day in this like amazing island um magical setting um you're dealing with like like really interesting themes like government corruption uh, there's like elements of racism and xenophobia involved uh, there's elements of like uh, sexual politics and sexual assault and in fact um there was a moment in this book that I was honestly like what like it was just not what I was expecting to happen or where I was expecting it to go but uh and I was just I couldn't stop laughing and I knew that Simon had read it as well so I was messaging Simon about it and we were, we were both laughing um but um yeah in an amazing way it's like it's like a shock turn but it uh, some of this is just like it's so fantastical and some of it like is a bit is it's almost ridiculous but in such a good way um and just everything is just really, really well done. Uh, Leonie Ross is a brilliant, brilliant writer. I think she'll be like an autobi author for me now. I'll, I'll definitely want to read other other stuff that she's done. Um, and uh, yeah, I would be surprised if this one isn't shortlisted uh, on the Women's Prize because I think it's amazing. Um, and yeah, so that's This One Sky Day or Poppy Show, depending on where you live, by Leonie Ross. Um, I'm yet excited to see how it does for the Women's Prize. But yeah, love that. So highly recommend. Okay, so next I read um, As a Buddy Read with Simon. I promise that's the last time I'll mention you in this video, Simon. Uh, we Buddy Read in The School for Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan. Um, so this is, um, what's the main character's name again? Did it? Frida. So basically this is kind of like a very near dystopia, so not like a like far off dystopia where loads of things have happened so that we end up in a slightly different world this is kind of based in our world but then it goes into dystopia over the course of the novel where basically the um, american government becomes very very interested in parenting and curbing what they consider to be poor parenting and uh, that's where we meet our character frida straight up the back i'm gonna say i did not like this book at all i thought it was i don't want to use a really harsh word but almost nonsensical <laughs> is where I would position it or it was just very very confusing to me some of the decisions that were made in terms of writing and editing this book. Essentially the book opens with the main character Frida who abandons her toddler for m m like multiple hours I think three or four hours just leaves her toddler in her house I think in like a wee like 
one of those like bouncy things that, that babies go in. Uh, I'm not sure what they're called. Uh, I don't have a child. My sister does those, so I'll ask her. Um, but um, just she, 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 she calls it her very bad day and obviously have a lot of empathy and sympathy. My sister has just had a baby. Um, that um, being a parent and being a new mother is very, very difficult. But I just don't understand how we were meant to feel about Frida as the main character when what she did to her child was kind of unforgivable or wasn't certainly something that in this real world would lead to serious questions about whether or not your child should be left in your care. So anyway, so that's like the, the very beginning of the book and then the government takes her child off her and puts her into the um, custody of the child's father, um, which fair enough. Um, <laughs> And then essentially takes Frida out of society and puts her into a school where she basically has to learn to be a mother based on the requirements of the government um, for a year. So instead of like prison, she goes to this school for good mothers. So I don't want to say too much about this because I don't want to be super negative and obviously I didn't enjoy it, but... I just don't understand. It felt as if the whole time the book was trying to like make it seem as if it was unreasonable what the government had done. Now, I don't think, I think once you're in the school and you see what's going on, it has been taken too far. But to me, as a storytelling, like as a way to like pitch this story, there were like people at the school who had had their child taken away from them for much less than Frida had. And in order for us to kind of connect with the idea that what the government was doing was wrong or was dystopic, Surely we should have been following a character who had done a lesser thing than abandon a toddler in a house alone for four hours. Um, so I, I took huge issue with that. And then also, I, obviously I don't want to spoil where the book goes, but I think just in terms of the world building, it didn't make sense to me the reason why the government cared so much all of a sudden. Like I think what makes really great speculative dystopian fiction is when even when you don't agree, like Gilead for The Handmaid's Tale, for instance, even if you don't obviously don't agree with the regime or the religion or whatever it is that's taken over into the, in this dystopic society, you understand their motivation, you understand the why of how you've ended up where you've ended up. In this book, there was no why. It did not make sense at all what the government was suddenly getting out of this crazy fascination with like um, people's parenting. At no point was that explained and um, yeah, the main character was just unlikable, um, felt quite 2D, none of the other characters felt particularly well developed to me. I think there was loads of areas that were missed and there were also like elements that just didn't need to be included that felt as if they were there just as page filler. Um, I did not love this at all. Simon, I think, liked it slightly better than me but didn't love it either and yeah. That's 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 all I've got to say about that. Yeah, so that was uh, the School for Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan. Uh, Jessamine Chan, sorry, my apologies. Um, but uh, one positive to, to end on a positive is I do think she's a good writer, and I do think her ability to tell a story is really good. And uh, I'm sure um, I'm not put off reading a new book that she brings out in the future. I just think. Um, this one wasn't for me and I felt a little bit confused at certain points of what was happening or why it was happening. So yeah, not the best. <laughs> Today's a bit of a wacky day in terms of weather. Um, so sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's not. So the light will keep changing. Apologies on that. Next, I read this proof uh, of a novella that was sent to me by Picador. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and that is We Had to Remove This Post by Hannah Berkowitz. Uh, this is just the proof cover, um, the, the final cover has been announced, um, I actually love this proof cover, to be fair. Um, this is a book in translation from Dutch, I'm pretty sure, let me double check. Um, um, yeah, it's translated by Emma Rolt and yeah, I'm going to say it's translated from Dutch. Um, so I really 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 enjoyed this it's like a little sucker punch of a novel it's just over it's under 150 pages but basically we had to remove this post you follow the lead character who gets um a job as like a content moderator for an unnamed social media corporation which i think is very strongly meant to suggest that it's facebook or in this fictional world it's facebook's equivalent um, and this is just fascinating because obviously that is people's job to decide what does and doesn't come, um, what's the word, 
what does and doesn't comply with um, the standards or the moderation standards of these platforms. So you do have people whose job it is to look at really disturbing content all day every day and decide whether or not it needs to get it pulled down. Because obviously these platforms have a um, responsibility to uphold things like free speech and uh, what isn't isn't allowed, what's hate speech, what's um, like protected speech, what's um, dangerous, what's not dangerous, what's violent, what's not violent. So I love the whole premise of this book um, and I thought it was really, really interesting. And essentially this um, character is writing a letter to a lawyer who has asked her to join a civil case or a, um, what's it called? I always forget what it's called, where it's like loads of plaintiffs come together to, to sue one thing, like what happens in Erin Brockovich. Um, but basically to do that and this lawyer is asking um, the central character to come on board and be part of the case and she's writing a letter back to him explaining why she won't um, but essentially people are trying to sue the corporation for like um, negligent infliction of like emotional distress from their jobs and they're not being adequate protections or like access to therapy or whatnot that people who do this job would need um, but it just becomes, this gave me like vibes of, if you liked, Night Shift by Kiari Ladner. I think you'd really enjoy this. It kind of becomes like a little cast of characters who are all doing this same very difficult job and how they kind of band together. Then like a queer relationship emerges between the lead character and another woman that she works with. And then it's really just about how you can kind of fall down a rabbit hole of... Um, like if you've ever struggled with mental health or mental illness and sometimes you don't realise how bad you've gotten until it's almost too late. Like you've you've missed all the warning signs and then suddenly you're in a really bad place and it feels as if you got there really suddenly. But when if you actually like trace back and look back a little bit, there were lots of warning signs or there were lots of like points along the way. Uh, I think this book did a really good job of like representing that and was just like a fascinating premise. So I really, really enjoyed this really, really quick. I think I read it in a single sitting um, and it is coming out, it doesn't say, soon. We're gonna go with soon. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I highly recommend picking this up. It's blurbed as well by Ling Ma who did Severance and it does have that kind of vibe. Um, so that is, we had to remove this post by Hannah Bervoetz. Uh, and thank you again to Pictor for sending me that proof. Next, I um, did a reread um, when I put a book into my top 10 from the previous year. Uh, so um, for 2021, I try my best to reread as many of them the next year, just to double check, <laughs> just to make sure that I actually really did like it that much. So this month I reread uh, Amelie Ratajkowski's My Body, her memoir. Um, it's kind of a memoir told over uh, a collection of essays. Uh, so this was I think number six on my top ten books of last year and it definitely stood up to the reread test. Um, this is like, um, if anyone's read this, this is like very visceral. Um, it's kind of like an, not an expose, but like an exploration of like um, celebrity culture, particularly the modelling industry and um, like obviously like I think it's like well documented that there's a lot of like horrible darkness associated with the modelling in the fashion industry in particular um but um so like none of this is particularly surprising but Emily uh, she's an amazing writer and um like it, this is like very compelling to read to me like it's it's a memoir but I couldn't I couldn't put it down I, I like it was like reading almost like a novelization like some pretty terrible things have happened to her uh, she's very very open and honest about like quite personal things like her relationship with her parents um and like kind of like where she came from in terms of like her childhood and how she ended up in the modeling industry she ended up in the modeling industry probably far too young but the whole industry is obsessed with youth so there's kind of almost no escaping that and it's really just like an exploration of the idea of what it means in the modern world to sell your likeness and sell your image and who actually owns what 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 she looks like or what a person looks like or her body and how society like demonizes or otherwise like the ways that we use our body like for instance as as a sex worker um working in porn uh, why is that deemed by society as a uh, more unacceptable use of your body than for instance if you were like a minor or a builder where obviously your body is a huge part of your job as well um is kind of like the themes that she's exploring here my favorite essay in here is one called case Spa. I think it's called, where basically, um, like there's, oh, this is signed as well. I knew it was signed, but I'd forgotten. Uh, book bar, always coming through with the signed books. Um, 
and uh, yeah, case spa, which is um, basically uh, a essay where she goes to like, um, these Korean spas in downtown Los Angeles, and it's kind of like a place where she can go to escape where she feels anonymous, um, which is obviously quite rare for someone who her image and, and what she looks like is kind of like the basis of uh, her, her career and ergo a lot of her life. Um, and she feels anonymous, but it's almost like this like purging of herself um, and like it, how feeling anonymous, but then like her skin is scrubbed and she almost like comes out a new person. And yeah, there's like a really, really dark element to this where um, like you feel really connected to uh, Emily Ratajkowski and feel not sorry for her but um, almost worried for her in a sense but it's been told in the past so it's like there's this inevitability of like all these like quite bad or dark things have already happened to her she's already been in these like dangerous or scary or um, like dark situations but you're kind of worried about her the whole time and then obviously it culminates in she's had a baby and how like having a baby felt like she was like reclaiming her body and it gave her body like a new purpose that was predicated on what she wanted her body to be used for and giving her body like to her child um, versus like having like kind of been put in a situation where she was giving her body away to other people to make money for like the, the earlier part of her life. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining this well at all but I really 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 enjoyed this book uh, and it stood up very well to a reread and I highly highly recommend it to pretty much everyone um, and I think from the kind of tone of the book this is kind of what she wants to focus on now. She kind of wants to be a writer um, as like her primary, um, like her primary job, if you like, like what, what it is that she wants to be particularly known for going forward. And I would absolutely, I think she would write an amazing novel. Like, yeah, I would love, I would love to read a novel. And um, so fingers crossed. Uh, Emily, you won't watch this, but if you do, please write a novel. Um, there we go. Yeah, so that's My Body by Emily Ratajkowski. Love that. So the next uh, one, two, three, four books are um, will be doubled up because they will also be in my prize book haul, but I've already read them. Uh, these are all books that were long listed for the International Booker Prize. As I said in my previous video, I always feel like the International Booker Prize gives you a really small lead time between the um, long list and the short list announcement. I'm pretty sure the short list announcement is like a week from now. Um, so I wanted to get, get going with like the ones that I wanted to read from that list and I think I, I've read more than half of them now. Um, so yeah, so the first one is Paradise by Fernanda Melkor and it's translated from the Spanish by Sophie Hughes. This was an absolute must read for me because... Oh god, where is it? <laughs> Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melkor that was also shortlisted, it was longlisted and then shortlisted I'm sure for the book, uh, the International Booker a couple years ago. This is in my top 10 books of all time, so I absolutely needed to read this. Uh, truth be told, I've already ordered the actual hardback, similar with this. This is the Fitzcarraldo edition. Similar with this, I initially read the Fitzcarraldo edition and loved it so much, I was like, I need the actual hardback cover of this book for just to have. <laughs> so I've already got the, I preempted that I was gonna enjoy this and then ordered, pre-ordered the um, proper hardback with the, the proper publisher cover and stuff. Um, no offence to Fitzcarraldo, they're beautiful books, but I like to have variety. I don't like all my books to look the same. Um, and this, this I did really enjoy. I loved it, but I did kind of feel like it was the diet version of this. Like if I'd read these at a different time, I would have thought this came before this one, just because a lot of like the themes and ideas it feels that are explored in Hurricane Season, it feels like she does it here, but to a lesser extent. But I always think if you're comparing two things that you really, really enjoy, one is always going to lose, but that doesn't mean that it's bad. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, if you prefer, I don't know, the Beatles over Oasis, does it necessarily mean that one is better than the other? And that one is better, one, that one is less deserving of praise than the other, like they're both very good. I actually don't like Oasis, I don't know why I use that as an example, but you know what I mean. Uh, so I really enjoyed this and basically this is set um, on like a kind of like luxury housing development in um, Mexico. And um, there's basically two sort of, you, you follow uh, uh, the lead character and it's kind of told from his perspective, um, but not in first person and third person, but you kind of follow him. Um, and he 
hates his life. He doesn't live on the luxury housing development. He's a gardener. He lives in a very poor part of town that's kind of hidden away from the luxury development. Uh, but he just goes there each day to be a gardener and he kind of strikes up like a like hate ship, I'm going to call it. Certainly not a friendship. It's like a friendship of convenience with like a really rich kid who lives in the development. But really it's just because our main character is kind of like a teenage alcoholic. He's very unhappy with his life. He feels like he has no prospects. He's sort of badly treated by his mother. Uh, and so he's like kind of turned to, to drugs and alcohol. Uh, and obviously that rich kid on the housing development has easier access to money to fund that habit. Um, the kid on the housing development, I... I actually read this really late at night, so I've forgotten um, their names. But I, and I, I read it in one sitting, I've like fired through it. So Polo is the Polo is the, the lead character, and then the rich kid that lives on the house housing development is called Franco, and he is awful, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, uh, he's addicted to porn, and he's addicted like, and this is like very graphic as is this. So if you don't like graphic books, if you don't like obscenities in books, and if you like what Fernanda Melkor does very well is honestly horrific, odious characters and casts of characters where there is no redemption. There is no one who you kind of sympathise with or there is, or you you kind of do sympathise with them, but there's like no, there's no redemption for their character. It's just a cast of all horrible people. It's like Otessa Moshfeg, if like you thought, if you think her characters are unlikable, you ain't seen nothing yet. These are unlikable characters. Um, so very similar in that regard between the two books um but and um yeah so uh franco the rich kid is obsessed with this woman who lives on the housing development who is the wife of a famous tv actor and he kind of becomes obsessed with her family but it particularly obsessed with her sexually obsessed with her and um basically the book goes on and it just ends up it's like one of these like it's almost like a coming of age story where you make really 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 bad choices in the heat of the moment and then before you know it like everything is completely out of your control very very dark um very like visceral like i say there's like ob like obscene things happen in this book and the description of them it does not hold back so if you are easy like easily shocked or don't like to read things that are like quite graphic and disturbing then don't read either of these books but um i i'm i feel like i'm very like i'm quite tuned into like or for me personally anyway like when some when I understand the reason for something, why like an author has done it that way, or when it just feels like, oh, this is just here to shock us, like, oh, like, do you know what I mean? And for me, Fernanda Melkor, the reason why these characters are horrible, the reason why this is so graphic and obscene is because it's like the lying and like the true darkness that kind of sits, or in Fernanda Melkor's opinion, I guess, sits at the very core of all of us. Like the things that we would never say out loud, but think in the back of our heads, the things that we would never admit to. Um, but taken to a very extreme extent so um, yeah no I really really enjoyed this but I didn't enjoy it as much as Hurricane Season and but the two are very similar but would highly recommend reading this if you did enjoy uh, Hurricane Season because if you enjoyed this you will enjoy this and um, I think this probably will be shortlisted but I don't know if I can be totally objective because I really did enjoy it and I'm just a fan um, but I think this probably will be shortlisted. So this is Paradise by Fernanda Melkor on the International Booker Longlist and it is um, translated by Sophie Hughes. Then next, another uh, uh, International Booker Longlisted book, After the Sun by Jonas Aika, I think is how you would pronounce that. And this is translated from uh, Danish by Oh, I think this is the one. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, one of the books on the, on the long list is translated by the author. So the author has translated it from their native language, which I think is like, imagine being able to do that. <laughs> uh, that's an amazing thing to be able to do. But no, this is translated by Sherilyn Nicolette Helberg. This is a collection of short stories, um, but it's, it's very narrow. I think it's only five stories and two of them are actually the same story, just split in the middle. Um, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, very trippy and very bizarre and kind of like like magical realism but very dark ma magical realism uh, cut through with like very very realistic like a very real world setting and then all of a sudden something totally bizarre will happen um 
queer representation, um, like an enjoyable, like quite compulsive read. The stories were very disparate, I felt, like they're like the kind of like the through theme to me anyway was like the idea that you're always kind of alone, like no matter what relationships you form in your life or or how connected you feel to other people when like big when big things happen, you're kind of always alone. I don't believe in that, but that's obviously what, what that's what I took from this, what 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 the kind of point was. Um my favourite story was a story called Rachel, Rachel Nevada, I think is the name of the story. Um, yeah, Rachel Nevada, so Rachel's the name of a town in Nevada, not a person, and it took me a few pages to figure that out. Um, but, which is a story about grief and about how grief is simultaneously the most natural feeling in the world, but it also feels completely alien, and how, like, when you're grieving, you like you feel as if like you're like screaming into a void and no one can hear you because it's such a natural thing it happens to it happens to everyone probably at some point in their life but when it happens to you it feels like it's never happened to anyone before and <laughs> because it's, it's like this huge and you feel as if like there must be somewhere that you can put the weight of this feeling that like there must be somewhere big enough for this feeling to go and there's not and um, i find that story really 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 powerful and um also really interesting um, and but I, I liked all of the stories to be fair I liked the first story a lot but it kind of didn't go where I thought it was going to go um, this one will it be shortlisted I am not sure I really enjoyed it um, but um, I'm going to go with just as like a prediction I'm going to go with yes I think this will be shortlisted and I really enjoyed it so this is Jonas Aika uh, After the Sun a collection of short stories. Uh, I think you'll probably like that if you liked, um, well, I don't know where it is, but if you liked uh, The Dangers of Smoking in Bed, which was uh, shortlisted last year, um, which is a collection of kind of very dark, twisty short stories. I think if you like that, you'll probably like that one. So definitely pick it up. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm just going to put this one away. Um, then next, this is the one to beat for me so far. I read Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro, which is translated by Francis Riddle from Spanish, I believe. Um, yeah, it's set in Buenos Aires. Um, so yeah, translated from Spanish, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is brilliant. This is, this month I've read two of my favourite books of the year so far. This is one of them. Um, this is uh, tells the story of an old woman called Elena and she's suffering with really severe Parkinson's um, and basically the whole kind of like uh, storytelling device of this book is that she takes a medication um, that, that people who have severe uh, Parkinson's take and it kind of in between the time from when she takes the pill and when it starts to take effect she's unable to move um, and um, that's kind of like the, like the way that the story's broke up. Um, and her like reliance on this medication to get something done. It's told over the, uh, the course of one day, basically Elena's daughter has recently died. Everyone thinks that she's committed suicide, but Elena is convinced that she's not. And she's kind of going on this quest to find someone to help her prove that her daughter was murdered. Um, but, and which is why like it's really important that um, she needs to take these pills because otherwise she can't move. And you're kind of like struggling to go on this journey with her um, to, to get to this person. This book went to a place I did not expect, was not expecting that to be where it ended up, but was blown away when it got there. It's making such an important point, um, and um, which obviously I, I don't want to reveal, but makes such an important point in such a such a, a strong way of like how we shouldn't and can't put our morality or our ideas of what isn't isn't right onto other people, um, and kind of tells a story I've never seen told before, but is all told through this device of like you thinking it's kind of like a murder mystery thriller um yeah i don't want to say too much for this book because it's just such a great experience to read it uh, it's also like kind of novella length it's under under 150 pages but um like amazing so to me this is the one to be if this is not shortlisted i will have a huge tantrum um and uh yeah, I feel like I've maybe not explained this very well, but it's it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, sometimes I find that the books that I like the most are the ones that I find the most difficult to explain. Um, but this is really, really brilliant. Um, I um, thought the representation of disability and stuff was was uh, one of the best that I've certainly ever read uh, in terms of like how 
it really it, like I like it really made you feel like or gave you like a glimpse of like how it would feel to be in in Elena's position. Um and um yeah, you're kind of like flipping back and forth between feeling really sorry for her. She's obviously really missing her daughter, but then it goes back and you see the relationship that they had and her daughter's not very you you kind of feel that her daughter wasn't very good to her, but then was she very good to her daughter? And it's it's like the amount of complexity and depth and richness of the characters in this book for such a short book is insane. But then beneath or on top of all that, there's this huge like kind of like like overall arching point that the that the author is making. I think this was originally published like quite a long time ago. No, it wasn't. Never mind, shut up. Um, like, but. Even still, it was originally published in the Spanish in 2007, and I think, like, for even even then, I think the point that this book was trying to make was probably, like, a little bit, like, quite daring and ahead of its time, especially in a setting that's that's quite uh, religious or, like, quite Catholic. So, um, yeah, absolutely love this. One to beat for me. If you're only going to pick up one book from the long list on the International Book of Long List, I would highly recommend it's this one. So that is Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro. Um, translated by Francis Riddle. Last book that I read um, from the International Booker Long List, I've still got a couple to read, um, but you'll see which, which other ones I've picked up in my book haul for the prizes, was Heaven by Miko Kawakami, um, which is translated from Japanese by uh, Sam Bett and David Boyd. This was my first ever Miko Kawakami. I know people absolutely raved about Breast and Eggs uh, and um, like she's kind of like a canon author of like Japanese translated fiction. People um, really, really love her. This was my first delve into her. I am, um, I wouldn't say indifferent. I did enjoy this book, but I wasn't blown away by this book. And I, if it was up to me, I don't know if I would shortlist it. Um, to me, this book, so basically this book it follows the uh, two main characters, an unnamed narrator and then he becomes friends with a girl called uh, Kojima and basically they're both horrifically bullied at school, um, bullied so much to the extent that they don't even want other people to know that they're friends because if people know, if people connect the two between them as like these two sort of victims of bullying, it'll exacerbate the bullying even more so they start uh, communicating with each other through letters that they'll like, send to each other at school uh, which is obviously very relatable in terms of I think everyone used to do that at school at some point um, and then they start meeting outside of school um, and kind of become friends and it's this kind of like story of friendship like and support when like you don't really have any elsewhere. The graphic depictions of bullying is actually a very graphic long list this year there's like a lot of like like it's quite graphic just all of these books so far have been quite graphic um yeah it's really harrowing hard to read um but um and i suppose like the overarching theme or overarching theme for me was like what is the purpose of a relationship if the only reason why you have the relationship is from like a negative sentiment like if you're only friends with someone because you don't like someone else or you're only friends with someone because they're also being bullied like what what else what else is the relationship built on and is that healthy I suppose um the reason it, so like there was a lot to like about this book and I did like it I found it like really like uh, not easy to read it's obviously a difficult subject matter but like was like an enjoyable reading experience uh, like going through it and stuff I just felt like there were like moments where it's obviously a really short book um and there were bits that I felt didn't need to be there which I think in a short book kind of stands out more um there was I don't know, there was just like an element to me of like contemporary fiction by numbers at some points, like, oh, like I'll add this in because that's like just like a very like literary contemporary fiction thing to have in here. Um, it's kind of how I felt at certain points. Um, and then also I felt like what the story was actually about and then where it kind of ended up in terms of like the ending seemed a bit peculiar to me. Essentially the main character, um, the reason he the reason why he thinks he's being bullied so viciously is because he has a problem with one of his eyes um and uh, like a, like a, a obvious like visible difference in one of his eyes um and then there's like a weird kind of like there there's like this section where it feels as if like um the author is trying to like make like this really use a character to make this really big like n nihilistic point about like oh people don't people don't bully other people or people don't do bad things because 
of X, Y, Z, they do bad things just because they want to do bad things and there's no point in trying to understand why. I just don't really ascribe to that point of view and I didn't feel like the character that she had saying these things was even convincing that he believed in those things. It just, I, I don't know, it just didn't really hit the mark for me. Um, would I pick up another book by um, Miko Kawakami? Mm, no, I don't think I would, to be honest. But that's not to say I didn't like this book. I just, um, yeah, no, I just felt a little bit, I suppose, indifferent is the right word. Um, but I know a lot of people really enjoyed it. So, um, oh, and it was good in some ways. Like I think in terms of like the depiction of bullying and just like the theme of bullying, it, it does, um, I think it can be relatable to a lot of people. Um, but yeah, just a warning that it is very vicious and very um, violent, the bullying. So um, yeah, this was a bit of a mixed bag for me. Um, I, If it was up to me, I don't think I would shortlist it, but I have a feeling that this might be shortlisted just because I think it's getting a lot of like good press and there's like a lot of good favour for this book and this author at the moment. So yeah, uh, so that's Heaven by Miko Kawakami, translated by Sam Betts and... David Boyd? Yeah, Sam Beck and David Boyd. Um, here we go. And then lastly, last but not least, I've actually saved this for last deliberately because this book, you guys, this book, and I've got, I've got both the proof and the hardback edition now. Um, I was at the launch party for Maddie Mortimer's Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies last night and uh, there was like a reading, it was amazing, there were cocktails, it was amazing, and uh, Maddie signed my copy of the book as well, gave me a dedication, in which she called me Drake, <laughs> um, which is funny. Um, this book, so th this has obviously been like one of the most highly anticipated books, I think maybe ever, <laughs> like uh, to be honest, like I think it's just been everywhere and deservedly so. This is going to be one of these books that I'm, I'm just not even going to be able to explain it. Essentially, the main character, Leah, is diagnosed with um, cancer. Um, and very quickly, it becomes, it's the second time in her life she's had cancer before and it's gone away and come back. And very quickly, it becomes clear that um, it's it's incurable. She's, she's not going to survive. Um, and then it tells the story of her life, but it's told from two narrators' perspectives. It's told from Leah's perspective. Uh, outside of her body and then it's told from the perspective of inside her body almost as if the cancer is a narrator in itself and you're following how the cancer has like has done what it's done to her body over time but then over time it kind of becomes clear that it's not necessarily the cancer it's more how every single experience you have in your life every single person you interact with in your life leaves a mark on the inside of your body and it's so it's so visceral it's funny it's so sad it's um it's just kind of everything and it's so brilliantly told and the writing is just incredible it's beautiful some parts it's like poetry some parts it's prose um like the interaction of the two the two narrators voices like this is just so accomplished <laughs> for lack of a better phrase like i cannot believe that this is a debut novel i i think maddie's 25 years old i cannot believe that someone um I mean, I'm 28, so I, like, I'm not massively older, but like the idea that someone who, who's not even like, who, 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 someone who's like that young can have, can write this way is just like, a, a, like incredible to me. And just like, um, like the, the understanding of like the human experience and the understanding of like relationships and the way that like everything in this book feels so, so, so real, even like the fantastical elements of like what's going on inside the body feels so real, so well researched, um, just absolutely brilliant. And last night at the, um, and it's so sad, like so, so sad, I sobbed, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit it, I sobbed, uh, I was nearly crying last night at the reading, at the party, um, at, at the reading they had uh, the lady, I forget her name, apologies, who reads the, so in the, in the audio bit, one person reads the narrator from inside her body and another person reads the, uh, Leah, the narrator of, of the lady who's suffering with the cancer, uh, and last night Maddie and the woman who reads um, the inside body section did like this kind of like back and forth reading that was like, it was like being in the theatre, it was amazing. Um, and um, sorry, yeah, I'm just blabbering, I, I cannot say enough good things about this book. Um, it's, uh, I think it's going to have knocked another book off of my top 10 of all time, to be honest. I. Um, like absolutely loved it. Uh, 
you learn about her mom, her relationship with her mom is so like potent, her relationship with her young daughter, like there's like a section where she's like, um, like talking about like how is she going to explain to her daughter who's like 11 or 12 that she's going to die. Um, oh yeah, I, I, I don't think I can talk too much more about this book because I will cry. So definitely, definitely whoever you are, if you probably, I would say, I know it's early, but if you only read one book this year, make it this one. Um, that is Maps of Our Spectacular Body by Maddie Mortimer, which came out yesterday. So get your hands on it. Um, thank you so, so much to Picador for sending me the proof. Um, and just, just very, very good. <laughs> that's, it does everything that a book should do. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, I feel like... I feel like I've really enjoyed so many of these books that I've done quite a poor job of explaining some of them, but hopefully what comes across is my passion and hopefully uh, some of these will now appeal to you. Um, overall, a really strong month for me. Um, I love prize season. I'm excited to show you guys all the other books that I've picked up from the prizes. Um, but yeah, I'll do my, do my standard thing now of picking them up. Um, so this is all the books that I read in March. Oh, there you go. Um, overall, a really strong month uh, for me. I love prize season, so I love getting into the prizes. Um, and then uh, the cherry on top of the cake for me was Maps of Our Spectacular Body. Um, it's one of those books that's so hyped that I feel like people will start to like kind of like pull back from it and be like, oh, it's maybe overhyped. I understand that feeling. I've had that feeling. This is not a book to be missed, in my opinion. If you're going to fall for the hype on a book, make it that one. Um, so yeah, uh, overall a really strong month. I think I've probably already said that um, and I will see you guys on my next video which will be my book prize haul. I'm excited to show you the other ones that I picked up uh, as well as the ones that I've covered here. Uh, as always, thank you so much for joining me. I uh, really appreciate your support and um, yeah, let me know in the comments if you've read any of these, if you're interested in any of these, if you disagree with my brutal takedown of the School for Good Mothers, I would love to talk about it. Um, and yeah, definitely thank you guys and I will see you on the next video. Bye!